All right, so today we're gonna do photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis usually I call, or I, I'll name it, the cousin. It's the cousin of cell respiration. Why is the cousin of cell respiration? Because they kind of have the same purpose. They basically produce energy. When we did cell respiration, we used glucose plus oxygen, and we end up with uh, carbon dioxide plus water plus ATP. Now, in the case of uh, photosynthesis, we're just going to do the reverse of it. We use carbon dioxide plus water, and we get the energy from the sun, and we turn it into glucose, and as a byproduct, we get oxygen. So that's why I really call them the cousin, because they're kind of related. If you look right here, this is cell respiration. At the bottom, it's photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis, breaking it down. Photo means light. Synthesis, you synthesize. You make something. You produce something. So you use the light, in our case of photosynthesis, to produce glucose. So we use the light to produce glucose. Now, this process right here, photosynthesis, it is autotrophic. Trophic means food level. Auto means on its own. So basically, plants make their own food. That's why the process is autotrophic. Now, last week, let me see this part right here. Last week, this was the reaction, or Monday, sorry, was this, this was the reaction that we talked about. Carbon dioxide plus water, sorry, not carbon dioxide, glucose plus oxygen turns into carbon dioxide and water. Today, we're gonna do the reverse. And as I mentioned, the process is autotrophic because they, plants do not use food, they make their own food. Last week, we went over oxidation and reduction when we talked about cell respiration. Now, whatever was oxidized during cell, during cell respiration, it's gonna be reduced now. So last week, let me write this reaction again, carbon six, hydrogen 12, oxygen six, plus six oxygen turns into six carbon dioxide plus uh, six water. We went from glucose to carbon dioxide. So I said that glucose was losing the hydrogen. Who's gonna pick up the hydrogen? These hydrogens were going to the oxygen. So the process through which this glucose was losing hydrogens or electrons was called oxidation then. The process through which oxygen was gaining the hydrogen or the electrons and the electrons was called reduction. Now check out this reverse process right here. The process through which carbon dioxide turns into glucose now, the reverse process, it's reduction because it picks up this carbon dioxide, picks up the hydrogens from here, from water, and turns into glucose. So carbon dioxide gains hydrogens and electrons. During the, this process, water splits and loses these hydrogens right here. Now, since it loses these hydrogens, it's left only with oxygen. So basically it shed hydrogens and electrons. While it shed hydrogens and electrons, the process, it's called oxidation. So when you lose, you get oxidized. And when you gain, it's called reduction. Now, in nature, these processes happen, for example, when you see rusting. When you see a piece of iron, iron rusting, 
what happens basically that iron gets oxidized, basically loses or gains electrons. Now, uh, right at the beginning of the semester, we talked a little bit about plants and the chloroplast when we were talking about the cell right there. Now, the green part in the plant, it's the part that actually photosynthesize, the green part of the plant. Why? Because that green part right there, it's made up, we learned at that time, by this pigment, which is called chlorophyll. Now, chlorophyll, it's the one that has the ability, is the pigment that has the ability to absorb the energy from the sun. Now, if we look back here, for the photosynthesis to take place, it's not only, it's not only chlorophyll and the sunlight. You also need carbon dioxide and you need water. Now, how do plants get carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide comes from the air and it moves inside the plants through these little holes at the bottom of the leaf or the top sometimes, but most of the time you're gonna find them at the bottom. These holes open up and close, open up and close. They close basically when there is no water around uh, or there's no water in the soil or they close also the days when it's very hot outside. Why? To prevent evaporation of water. They open up at nighttime or when, or they stay open when there is plenty of water and it's not very hot. So that opening in the plant or the leaf, it's called stomata. So if you look right here, carbon dioxide goes in, water comes out through stomata. Now, as you notice right here, during drought, the stomata actually stay closed to prevent evaporation or loss of water. Now, as carbon dioxide goes inside the leaf, it will diffuse inside the chloroplast. Where do plants get water? Obviously, they're not just gonna get it from the air. When it rains, they're just gonna expect, wait for rain to get the water. They get the water through the roots. Now, through the roots, water goes up the trunk, from the roots to the trunk or to, through the stem to the leaves where the actual photosynthesis takes place. And that's where water it's found. Now, water moves up through these two vessels. They are called xylem and phloem. Now, xylem is the one that actually takes up the water plus the nutrients, plus the minerals, basically, the, the minerals that they need. Phloem is the, are the vessels or the tubes that carry glucose or sugars around. So xylem goes basically from the roots, if this is a tree, let's assume this is a tree, xylem goes from the bottom, so xylem goes from the bottom, and phloem will go between the leaves and everything else. Why? Because after glucose is produced, it's distributed throughout the plant. It's distributed throughout the plant where, the, where it's needed. Why do we need sugars? We learned last time, sugar was needed for the process which was called cellular respiration. You need sugar to produce what? ATP, you need sugar to produce ATP for the plant. So, uh, oxygen is another byproduct which comes out through the same stomata. So oxygen comes out through here also through the stomata. Now, let me break it down one more time. So make sure that you guys understand. So cell respiration and photosynthesis. Or actually, no, let's do it like this. So, so far we know cell respiration needs glucose to turn into ATP. Photosynthesis uses 
carbon dioxide plus water to turn into glucose. Now, both of them basically are producing energy or during both processes you produce ATP. Now here, when you break down glucose, ATP it's used by cells, used by cells. Photosynthesis also produces ATP, but this ATP it's used to make or, photo, or used to synthesize glucose. So this whole ATP that plants produce through photosynthesis, and we're gonna go in a minute and we talk about it, it's used to actually make glucose. Then the plants use glucose to make ATP through the process of cell respiration. So plants have both processes, photosynthesis in plants, we have both processes, photosynthesis and cell respiration. Humans or animals, humans slash animals, have only cell respiration. So plants are the main source of food for us. If the sun will die, eventually the people say, science, physicists say that sun will die in a billion years, basically the whole planet will die too. Why? Because there is no sun, there is no energy that comes from it, so plants can produce this food, which is glucose, so animals can survive. All right, oops. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Now, photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast. Photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast. We talked about it a while back. Chloroplast, it's made up of stroma, thylakoids, and chlorophyll. Let's go each one individually. What you see right here, this would be the chloroplast. What you see inside this whole arrangement it's called grana or granum. Each one of these little discs right there, it's actually the thylakoid. Inside the thylakoid, and thylakoid looks like this part right here, guys. Inside the thylakoid, there is a lumen or a part where there's a bunch of enzymes they are required for photosynthesis because photosynthesis takes place in here. One of the parts of photosynthesis takes place in the thylakoid, the one that absorbs the energy. So basically this green part kind of that you see right here, this is the actual chlorophyll. It's part the, or it's chlorophyll. Now also you have extra machineries right here, like we've seen already during cell respiration to produce ATP. This is one of those which is called ATP or ATPase or ATP synthase complex. Now photosynthesis, it's broken down into two main sets of reaction. First, it's called light reaction. And the second one is called Calvin cycle reaction. Now light reaction, it means that they are dependent on light. Calvin cycle, they are independent. They don't need a light. Now, basically, critical thinking skill, let's apply it here. If it's light dependent, it means that does what? It means that it gets the energy or it absorbs the energy from the sun. Now, if it absorbs the energy from the sun, the only thing that it can produce during this process, during light reaction, it's what? A bunch of ATP. Now this ATP produced right here, it's gonna be used into the second step or the Calvin cycle when it's called light independent. In the second step or the second set of reaction or the second step, you don't need any more light. Why? Because we have or we produce a lot of ATP which can be used here to actually produce the glucose. So 
in the first step, the light, or let me write like this, dependent, dependent, you produce a bunch of ATP. ATP then it's used in the independent to produce what? Glue cause. So if you notice here, in the first step, plants use the energy from the sun to produce ATP. In the second step, it actually produces the glucose. Now, this is, the, this is what plants and animals use to actually grow and to get bigger. So you have here the explanation, light dependent converts light energy into chemical energy, produces ATP. Light independent uses, uses ATP to produce the sugar. Now, light reactions require light, occurs in the chloroplast and require chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the one that absorbs the solar energy. Now let's see how the heck do plants can absorb the energy from the sun or the energy that comes from the sun and they can turn it into ATP because what happens right here, chlorophyll just absorbs the solar energy. Now the solar energy has to be turned into ATP. We don't have the ability to do that. So that's why we just cannot produce directly from the sun when we go outside. Now what happens basically, we're gonna learn, it's a little bit of physics and chemistry. Light excites electrons. It's kind of like a kid. Imagine you give sugar to a kid. What is it gonna do? It's gonna get excited, it's gonna have a lot of energy. Now electrons, they can't use sugar to get excited. The only thing they can use, it's light. Now, the energy from the light can, through electrons, be turned into ATP. Now, remember we talked about thylakoid, that's where the actual ATP is gonna be produced. Now, as a byproduct of the first step, release oxygen. So, Let's see what happens in the first step, the light dependent reaction. Oh, actually, uh, let me go quickly over the light independent, what I do, and then we're gonna go over the whole cycle. Now, light independent or the Calvin cycle does not require light. Now, this one does not occur in the thylakoid, occurs in the stroma. So remember, this was the chloroplast. Here, you had the thyla right they were connected and the part outside was called stroma and that's how you guys should study when you study and you look at the slides try to draw the stuff so you can see if you can understand it the moment that you can see in your head when you close your eyes and you can draw you don't have to be a great a painter or drawer but you have to close your eyes and visualize how do the how does the chloroplast looks like okay i put a bunch of these quarters, you know, when you go and do laundry, those stacks of it, I put them in there. Oh crap, that would be granule. Now each quarter would be a thylakoid. In the thylakoid, we have chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the one that absorbs from the sun. Now the outside part, it's called the stroma. Stroma is that semi-fluid or the fluid where the enzymes required for the light dependent reactions are gonna be found. Now, sugar molecules during light dependent use carbon dioxide. So in this process, we use carbon dioxide to produce and the hydrogen ions to produce glucose. That's what it happens. Now, when we talked about cell respiration, we had two transporter or coenzymes, we call, I call them at that time. We had NAD plus, and then we had FAD, which both of them transported hydrogen and electron around, transported hydrogen ions and the electrons, those dots that we need them at the end, those high energy electrons at the end. Now, this was for cell respiration. Cell respiration, those two were the enzymes. For photosynthesis, Actually, there is only one, which is called NADP+. So there is a P right there. 
this one also picks up the hydrogen plus the electrons or those dots and turns into NADPH. So for plants, or I'm sorry, for photosynthesis, we have NADP plus as the transporter around. Now, in the light independent reactions, we already have plenty of ATP and we're gonna learn that there is plenty of hydrogen which is required together with carbon dioxide to turn into sugar. Here you can see the actual uh, uh, Calvin cycle, carbon dioxide goes in, we have a bunch of hydrogen ions, we have the electrons that are coming together with the NADP plus and, and sorry NADPH and then these two together they'll form uh, glucose. This one is the glucose through these steps right here. You see ATP goes in, you see an ADPH goes in, you see ATP is needed there. Now quickly let's go over and see how light is absorbed by the plants or why do, light, why do plants absorb light and what, what uh, uh, um, spectrum or, or what part of the light spectrum it's absorbed by the plants. Visible light, it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. When you look right here, this one right here, this is the electromagnetic spectrum from gamma rays all the way to radio waves. If you look right here, radio waves are very large. Gamma rays have, are very small. Lambda or the wavelength, it's very small. Now, all these uh, um, different, different types of uh, um, um, wavelengths that are found in the electromagnetic spectru spectrum or energies found in the electromagnetic spectrum travel in the form of waves. That's why this number right here, nanometer represent wavelengths, it's called. Now, what the heck is a wavelength? The wavelength is basically, if you have something like this, the distance between two top of the waves, it's called the wavelength. Now, if you have a smaller wavelength, the distance is smaller. So as you go to the left, the distance gets smaller. Radio waves, it's about one kilometer or almost a, a, it's about two thirds of a mile, basically a wave. That's why radio waves travel so far and you're able to listen to all those uh, radio hosts in the morning, wherever you are. Somewhere here in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have the light, the visible light, the way we see it. Now this visible light, it's made up of seven different lights. You also know them as the rainbow colors. Now, if you look right here, this visible light is made up of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, uh, indigo, and violet. Plants in the thylakoids have this pigment, which is called chlorophyll. We already talked about it. Now, chlorophyll you notice right here, absorbs the sunlight, but most of the light it's absorbed. The only one that it's not absorbed and it passes through, it is green light. That's why leaves look, look green, because green is not absorbed. So basically light absorbs all the colors of the spectrum or all the freak, or, I'm sorry, all the wavelengths or all the energy of the, all the colors here with the exception of green. Green is going to be reflected. To give you an example, if I'll put a chloroplast right here, and then I put a filter right here, and then the energy from the sun comes. And this filter here that I put in the top absorbs all the color except green. Green is the only one that does not get absorbed. Green is the only one that can pass through. Will this chloroplast be able to produce energy? Obviously not, why? Because the filter absorbs all the color except green. And if you notice right here, green, it's reflected. So green doesn't, it's not used to produce energy. Besides chlorophyll, plants have a couple other pigments, carotenoids and, and xanto, Fills, they are called xanthophils. Now, 
xanthophylls and carotenoids give the leaves the different colors. Carotenoids give the orange color, orangish color, the beautiful uh, orange color that uh, leaves have in the winter. And xanthophylls are like a brown color. That's why in the winter, uh, sorry, er, late, early fall, when plants start shedding the leaves, they basically start losing chlorophyll. And then what's left behind is this other pigment, which are in way smaller amounts, carotenoids and xanthophyll. And that's why the plants in the winter, in the fall, early in the fall, they look orangish, brownish. So carotenoids reflect yellow, orange wavelengths. Brown is for xanthophyll. Now back to the photosynthesis. And let's go quickly over each of the two reactions or the two sets of reaction. Light reaction requires light, sun or a lamp, whatever it is, requires light. Now, for light reaction to happen, if you notice right here, when we talked, when I showed you the thylakoid, you see right here, there is one and there is two. There is one, there is two, there is two, there is one, there is one, there is two. What are those? Those are basically called photosystems. So for light reaction, there is a requirement for two photosystems. Photosystem PS1 and photosystem 2. Now, please remember this one. These photosystems requires a couple parts. A pigment complex or light antenna, in this case, is going to be what? Chlorophyll. The reaction center where the actual, basically where the actual pigment, chlorophyll, is going to start picking up the energy from the sun. And then there is an ele electron acceptor molecule. We're going to see in a minute why we need this one. So you need an antenna. You need the receiver right here. That's where the chlorophyll is. So the light from the sun gets directed here from the sun. Imagine this is a satellite dish. Hits it, and then this one gets, boom, hitting the chlorophyll. Something like that looks inside. Then inside here, the energy from the sun now, this energy or the photons, basically what they do, they're going to start exciting an electron. Now, this electron, we're going to learn in a minute, comes actually from water. So water, it's the one that produces, or not produces, sorry, provides the electron. Here, you guys have the description. Now I'm going to use the picture right here to go over what it happens. Now, this is the thylakoid. Inside of thylakoid here, outside of thylakoid. Remember, this thylakoid, it's in the chloroplast. And outside the chloroplast, we have what? Stroma. But stroma is not involved in the first process, which is the light reaction. Only and only the thylakoid. Now, this thylakoid, you see these membranes right here, like a, a, a plasma membrane, has the phosphate, has the two heads right there of fatty acids, phosphate. That's what basically it looks like. It's like a membrane. Now, what happens here, you have the two photosystem, one and two photosystem right here. Now, the interesting part is photosystem one was found or was discovered first. Then a few years later, scientists discover, oh shoot, there is a second photosystem, but unfortunately, photosystem two, it's before photosystem one. So basically, photosystem two starts the photosynthesis or the reaction. Then you have photosystem one. Now, why it's not photosystem one first and then photosystem two? Because it's how they were discovered. That's the only reason. So remember, light reaction starts with photosystem two. It's photosystem two. Now, photosystem two is called P, or it has the electron, uh, the electron acceptor part that excites the electron at 680. That's basically the wavelength. And if you look at the photosystem one, excites it at 700 or it's P700. 
Okay, even better. Let's go. This is how the thylakoid looks like. Here is the photosystems. Photosystem two, photosystem, what is it? What it says, photosystem one, right up there. Now let's go here even closer, more uh, zoom in, focus in. This is photosystem two, this is photosystem one. So remember, it starts with photosystem two and it finishes with photosystem one. Now, if you look at this membrane right here, do you see this little greenish part right here? Now, basically, those are the chlorophyll. So the photon from the sun or the light from the sun comes, it's absorbed by the chlorophyll. Chlorophyll transfer that energy, transfer that energy to this part right here, to this electron acceptor part. We talked about this part right here, electron acceptor. Now, since it's an electron acceptor part right here, an electron has to come here, an electron. Now, where is the electron coming from? From water. As plants absorb water, that water is used to provide constant flow of electrons in the electron acceptor. Now, when water is broken down, you end up with oxygen and a bunch of hydrogen ions. So it's oxygen and a bunch of hydrogen ions. Now, these hydrogen ions are just gonna float around here for a little bit. And we're gonna, I'll explain in a minute what's gonna happen. Now, as the electron ends up here, and there is plenty of electron because there is plenty of water. There is consistently, there's water needed. If there is no water, plant will die because there is no way of producing ATP. So these electrons absorbs, or this region right here, absorbs the energy from the um, chlorophyll, or the energy from the chlorophyll is passed here. Now this electron gets excited. When it gets excited, it gets bumped up to a higher level. You see right here, boom, it gets bumped right here where it's very excited. Now, this electron is gonna pass through an electron transport chain. This is the electron transport chain. Almost the same thing or works exactly the same way as the one that we discussed in cell respiration. Now, what do you produce in electron transport chain? ATP. Remember, we had here, the, if you look right here, this would be actually the protein or the, would be the, 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 the um, machinery that produces ATP, was the ATP synthase complex. So as the electron goes from high level, goes through this mill right here or machinery, it loses that energy. Now remember, let's go right here. Oops, actually let's go, I think it was right here. Was it right here? Yes, right here. You see these hydrogens that are here? that I told you earlier, you're gonna produce a bunch of these hydrogens here. You're gonna have a ton of these hydrogens right here. Notice that these hydrogens actually, these hydrogens are passed where? Outside, outside the thylakoid. How are they passed outside the thylakoid? Because the electrons, as they move down, the electron transport chain is kind of, like, kind of like a ramp here. It's like a ramp. As they go down, they release energy. Now that energy, it's used to pump these hydrogens outside. Now when you pump all these hydrogens outside, you create a high concentration of hydrogens outside. Now these hydrogens, as they go outside, what are they gonna do? They're gonna be picked up by the NADP plus. We're gonna see in a second. But as the hydrogens are passed down, ATP is produced through the ATP synthase complex. Now, why do we need energy? To pump this hydrogen from here, here. Why? Because outside here, we have a really high concentration of hydrogen. So we go against the gradient. That's what happens in electron transport chain. We have a concentration gradient of hydrogen ion and this gradient it's used basically to produce ATP. Now, as the electron gets right here at the bottom of the ramp, it has no energy. Now, that's why there is the second photosystem. This second photosystem picks up the electron that started it here. It moved down this way, it ends up here. Now, another photon comes and excites it. 
Now these electrons, once it's excited, it's gonna be picked up at the end by the NADP. Remember, NADP plus, plus hydrogen plus two electrons turns into NADPH. Now that's how, that's how electrons and hydrogens are transported, attached to this coenzyme NADP plus. Now here you can see another way that shows you how ATP is produced. Electrons move down, ATP is produced. As electrons get here, gets excited again, then enzymatic reaction are added and turn into NADPH. So here it's NADP plus, plus electrons plus hydrogens. Here you can see another way, you see this white dude, which would be the photon with the little hammer spanks or hits the bottom of it, of that trampoline, electron gets excited. This Asian girl right here picks it up, pushes it through the mill. This one is gonna spin, and I'm gonna show you in a minute. And remind me guys at the end, if I uh, forget, uh, I can show you uh, uh, um, that video. It spins and produces a bunch of ATP. As it gets right here at the bottom, the electron has no more energy. Now this black guy, what does he do? Smacks again with that uh, hammer, boom, smacks it. Electron has energy. This Mexican guy right here picks it up, puts it into the bucket right here, which would be the NADPH. Now, how did I know what they are? I mean, it's pretty simple. This guy looks white, this girl looks a little Asian, this guy is black, and that guy has a mustache and he's Mexican. That's how I know them. Or he's Hispanic or Mexican. That's how I know the stuff. So remember, this is the picture, photosystem two, photosystem one. Remember, it starts with photosystem two, not photosystem one. Here you can see the reactions, ADP plus phosphate turns into ATP would be this part right here during ETC or electron transport chain, or this one here, or this one here, or this one here. So there is four or five or six of these different pictures that I gave you. NADP plus turns into an ADPH. Remember, it has those electrons too, somewhere there. Now oxygen was already produced. The oxygen that we breathe was already produced right at the beginning, right the first step. This whole photosynthesis could not start without water. And when water is broken down, produces oxygen. Oxygen already, it's outside the leaves through simple diffusion, comes out through stomata. The process through which ATP is produced, it's called chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis. And you have this explanation right there, okay? Phosphorylation, photophosphorylation, phosphate addition to ADP turns into ATP. Read that part. Here you see it again, different way. This is more uh, in depth on the Tylacoy lumen. You see the actual different types of protein label, PS2, B6F, PQH2. You don't need to know that stuff. All what I need to remember is PS2, electron energy from the sun, excited, goes through a electron transport chain, PS1 system is here, electron gets excited, picked up by the NAD plus, plus the electron plus the hydrogen, turns into NAD, NADP, sorry, NADPH. Here, the important part, right at the beginning, right at the beginning, right at the beginning, water turned into oxygen and to provide a bunch of those hydrogen. These hydrogens move out through the ATP synthase to produce the ATP. Okay, you guys have all this stuff in different, a bunch of different explanation, different explanation how ATP is produced here. And also you can see right here, the breakdown of how ATP is produced. This is basically this step right here that I kept that I discussed, this step here, or this step here, or this step that I showed you right here. This is the step. You can see it right here. Also, you can see it right here. Now, 
Calvin cycle reactions. What happens here? In the Calvin cycle reaction, basically, it's the light independent reaction, the one that there is no need for the sun. Here, the energy of the electrons was used to pump electrons inside. Why? Because they go against the gradient. Then that energy, while the hydrogens are moving from high concentration to low concentration, produces ATP. Now, the final product of the first two steps, it's ATP, NADPH, we already have those two, plus oxygen. But oxygen, I don't care. It's not needed in the second part or the second step. Only these two are needed, NADPH and ATP. These two are needed in Calvin cycle. ATP is energy, NADP brings the hydrogens and the electrons which are needed for the production of glucose. Now for Calvin cycle to take place, for Calvin cycle to take place, we need a couple things. Now, since it's called cycle, it means that it's going in circle and it means that there is something in here that has to be recycled to be called the cycle. If it was no cycle, it would not, it would, it would, the reactions will finish up or end. Now, for this cycle to take place, we need one molecule, which is called Ruby P. This Ruby P starts and it, it's, uh, and, and then it's going to be regenerated or reproduced at the end. So the three steps of Calvin cycle include carbon dioxide fixation, carbon dioxide reduction, and a regeneration or recycling of the Ruby P. Now, quickly, carbon dioxide fixation. Why do we need to fixate carbon dioxide? For one important reason, we need to fixate carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, it's a gas. If it would go inside the plant and it's a gas, it would not stick, it could not be used. It's kind of like you try to walk around and you try to use the oxygen around you to, re to, to see a bunch of reaction. For reaction to take, to take place or to happen, it has to be first fixated, carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is gonna be attached to the Ruby P molecule. So Ruby P picks up the carbon dioxide and fixate it. Then carbon dioxide or the next step will be reduction. What does reduction mean? We learned at the beginning. Reduction, it means that you, you, add, you add hydrogens and electrons. Now, where this hydrogen and electron comes from? Check it out here. From NADPH, which has the hydrogen ions and the electrons right there. Reduction, it means adding. Oxidation, when, when it's lo losing it. But in this case right here, carbon dioxide will pick up the hydrogen and the, ox the, the electrons. So now let's go quickly over what happens. Input, carbon dioxide, ATP, and ADPH. Once you input those, Calvin cycle can take place. The final product, it's called G3P or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which could be assembled together with more plus another G3P to turn into glucose. So remember, you need Ruby P and then eventually you need to recycle this Ruby P or regenerate this Ruby P. We cannot just disappear or we can just lose it. So the first step, as I mentioned earlier, it's the fixation of carbon dioxide to Ruby P. Now, carbon dioxide has one carbon. Ruby P has five carbons, five carbons. So now when you add Ruby P plus carbon dioxide, you have a final molecule with six carbons, six carbons. It was five carbon plus one carbon. It's gonna give us a six carbon. Next thing, what's gonna happen? This newly formed six carbon molecule is gonna break down into two, three carbon molecules. You don't need to know the names and I don't expect you to know any of the names. I expect you to know that Ruby P 
and you don't even have to know that cerebellus 5 is phosphate. You just have to know the Ruby P is the molecule that it's needed. It's very, very important. It's crucial in Calvin cycle because it fixates the carbon dioxide with the help of the enzyme Rubisco. So this is an enzymatic reaction. So you need an enzyme to fixate it. And then the same enzyme Rubisco comes here and breaks down this newly formed six carbon molecule into two, three carbon molecule. Once you have these two, three carbon molecules, the process of reduction takes place. And here basically carbon adds the Uh, hydrogens. The hydrogens are added right here through reduction, through reduction. Where these hydrogens come? From NADPH. Provides the electrons for reductions. Also, since all these processes or this process right here adds something, you require the energy. And as you can see right here, check it out. Carbon dioxide comes in, the enzyme Rubisco catalyzes the reaction carbon dioxide plus oh, plus ruby P, this molecule right here, plus ruby P, they stick together and then they turn into a six carbon, six carbon and oxygen molecule right here. It's a six carbon, you see? It's one, two, three, four, five, plus one, six. Six carbon and immediately the same Rubisco breaks down this six carbon molecule right here. It breaks it down into two, three carbon molecules. Now these three carbon molecules uses the energy on the form of ATP to take up the hydrogen and the electrons. Now this final product right here has a bunch of, you started with this with carbon and oxygen only. Here you're going to have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen right now. Why? Because there's a bunch of these hydrogens attached. Now, if you notice right here at this cycle, there is always six G3Ps formed from three molecules of carbon dioxide. Always six. Now, out of these six G3Ps, only one is used to produce glucose. Only one of the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Five of these molecules, see right here, five molecules are basically used to regenerate the Ruby P. Also in this process, energy is required. Regeneration. So carbon fixation, step two, reduction right here. Step three, release of one molecule, one molecule of G3P to turn into glucose. And step four is regeneration. So if you notice through this whole photosynthesis, basically we produce six G3Ps, but only one is used to make glucose. Pretty interesting. And five of them are used to regenerate the Ruby P. Imagine if we would use all six. Oh, then the cycle will stop. There's not gonna be called cycle anymore. Imagine that we use half of them, that we produce three times the amount of sugar that it's produced today in, by plants during photosynthesis. So now at the end, this glycerol 3-phosphate, one molecule, it's used, assembled to make glucose. And this is photosynthesis breakdown. You can see right here. I put a video right here that I would like you guys to watch it about photosynthesis and it shows you, it's not very long, but it shows you how photosynthesis happens. Now, before we leave, let's talk quickly about the greenhouse effect. What is that? All of you know what a greenhouse is. Greenhouse, it's basically a house where you grow stuff, right? It's made out of glass, a greenhouse. You put, that's where we grow our vegetables. So this one is made out of glass. Why? Because sunlight passes through the glass, then the energy or the heat or the infrared energy is trapped inside. So this is the house, let's assume. Glass, energy from the sun, boom, comes here. Energy is trapped inside. And now the plants here can grow really big. Now, the problem is that's how it works. And we use the energy from the sun for to grow our crops. 
or uh, um, our veggies. Now, this greenhouse can actually form on, for Earth. Earth works like basically as a greenhouse. Check this one out here. This is the Earth right here, the surface of the Earth. And somewhere here, we have these molecules in the air, a bunch of these molecules. Now, these molecules basically allow the energy from the sun to come and heat up the, the Earth. You guys know that the sun heats up the Earth because the days when it's very, very cloudy, most of the sun cannot penetrate and it feels very cold. Now, what happens right here? Basically, the energy can pass easily when it's clear. But in the atmosphere, we're putting so many extra gases these days, all these molecules, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon dioxide, um, methane. All these gases, they keep building up right here because we keep releasing from our activities. Now, these gases right here work literally like a glass allows the molecule, allows the heat, not the molecule, sorry, allows the, uh, the heat from the sun to penetrate and come close to the earth. But whatever it's reflected or deflected from the earth, this heat cannot escape. Why? Because these molecules right here are so dense that allows very little, only very little of that heat to escape. And most of that heat is gonna be bounced back to earth or radiated back to earth or trapped here. And that's how basically where did I put it right here? Global warming takes place. And that's why we have all these problems these days because a lot of this heat is somewhere here at high levels and then they start disturbing the air currents, the, the wind currents. Now the wind currents or the air currents, what they do? Once they get disturbed, they don't do exactly the same job as they used to do. Now, how do we mitigate this problem? How can we mitigate? There's no way of mitigating it. The only way of mitigating it is basically by just literally getting rid of the stuff that leads to re release of these chemicals. Now, methane comes from what? You know, it comes from cows. Some of it comes from cows. A lot of cows in the United Kingdom, Ireland, because it's a lot of, lot of green pastures there. So cows keep farting. At one point, uh, the House of Lords blamed the cows actually in 1980s on uh, global warming. So they were, they were um, asking if they can reduce the number of cows because that's the main culprit of global warming. But as we know, it's not that. Actually, the main culprit of uh, production or, or high levels of methane in the air, it's the um, landfills. Landfills produce tremendous amounts of methane and also the gas industry. Gas, methane, I'm talking about. Like when they, the companies that do fracking, fracking means cracking the rocks so then the methane trapped in the, in the, uh, between the rocks can be extracted. A lot of them actually, they, a lot of this fracking leads to a, a leaking of this methane into the air. A few years back, you guys about you heard about Porter Ranch, where they store the methane in the ground. There was a big, big, huge leak in the air, and most of that global warming for the past two years actually came from from that leak. Look online, and actually, it's pretty interesting. There was there were like billions of uh, uh, molecules of mole of methane, or amount of methane released in the air was tremendous from that leak right here, not far from where we live. Carbon dioxide, it's produced through what? Through our main activity. It's not from people breathing carbon dioxide, but it's mainly from the uh, power plant industry. When we, break, when we use coal, coal and when, uh, um, to produce energy. Nitrogen dioxide, where these ones are from? These ones come from our cars. Basically, <clears throat> our cars produce a lot of heat. In the atmosphere, there is plenty of nitrogen. There is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Now, when you have the right amount of heat or when it's very hot, like our engines, like in the combustion engine where the actual uh, explosion takes place to produce energy for the car, that's where nitrogen binds to oxygen and we release some of this nitrogen dioxide. How do we know they will release that? Just 
around three, four o'clock, go hiking and look above freeways. And you can see this really like reddish brownish plume or like reddish brownish haze. That is basically nitrogen dioxide. So these are three main culprits actually for the lead to global warming or to the greenhouse effect. Uh, basically ask how can we mitigate it? We can, basically we have to literally get rid of the uh, industry that produces these mass gases uh, in, in large amounts. And also we can mitigate by planting more trees so they can photosynthesize. They basically can produce more oxygen and take a, more, a lot of that carbon dioxide next to the power plants. Deforestation is a main problem these days because by deforestation, you reduce the amount of photosynthesis so more carbon dioxide will be um, released in the, uh, in the, will be stored or released in, in the atmosphere. Now here, you guys can go to the book or we don't even need the book. You can actually start filling up, filling in, not filling up, filling in here based on this uh, diagram right here. And this would be kind of, kind of like the uh, um, synopsis of photosynthesis. And then you guys can do this one question that I put right here. The function accomplished by the light dependent reaction is, and you guys have to answer it. This is a type of question. This is a very easy one, actually. So um, this is the type of question that you're going to have in the, uh, in the exam. So that's all.